Hey everyone, welcome back to another lesson. This lesson delves into the possible underlying mechanisms as to why some symptoms may occur in fibromyalgia. We're going to take a look at the interplay between stress, tryptophan, and serotonin signaling, and even some aspects of the immune system and how all of these may tie in together in the underlying pathophysiology of fibromyalgia. So to begin, we're going to take a brief look at an overview of symptoms of fibromyalgia. So the cardinal symptoms of fibromyalgia include widespread musculoskeletal pain, fatigue and sleep disturbances. There are also some psychiatric associated conditions with regards to fibromyalgia, including depression and anxiety. There can be some cognitive disturbances like fibro fog, so difficulties with concentration, and some other associated symptoms as well, including paresthesias and morning stiffness, among other symptoms. So if you want more information on signs and symptoms of fibromyalgia, please check out my lesson on that topic. So we're going to look at a possible underlying mechanism that may tie in a lot of these symptoms of fibromyalgia, and a lot of it's going to come down to serotonin dysregulation. So we're going to talk about how serotonin and some of those other things we talked about before, how they may play a role in causing some of these symptoms to occur. So let's first talk about serotonin. Serotonin is also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine or 5-HT. It is a monoamine neurotransmitter derived from dietary intake of tryptophan. And tryptophan is an amino acid that we get from a wide variety of dietary sources. Now, serotonin is very important. It acts to regulate mood, cognition, learning, memory, and sleep, among other physiological processes. So even at a basic look at serotonin and what it does, what it regulates, we can see that there may be some possible connection here. We see that in fibromyalgia, we already have issues with mood and cognition and sleep, and we see that serotonin is an important regulator of those processes. And in fact, dysregulation of serotonergic functioning is associated with symptoms of fibromyalgia, including cognitive disturbances, fatigue, and as we'll see later on, widespread pain. So what is some possible evidence of connection between fibromyalgia and serotonin? Now, some evidence that dysregulated serotonergic functioning may play a role in fibromyalgia symptoms comes from evidence that use of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs and SNRIs, or serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, is associated with improvement of symptoms of fibromyalgia. And some evidence came from a randomized control trial entitled Melnasoprine for the Treatment of Fibromyalgia in Adults, a 15-week multicentered randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multiple-dose clinical trial. So, Melnasoprine is an SNRI, and use of melnasoprine was found to improve associated mood and anxiety symptoms of fibromyalgia, and also some of those fatigue and sleep disturbances as well. So that's one possible line of evidence. Now, it's also been found that pain disorders, including fibromyalgia, have been found to be associated with dysregulation of serotonin functioning, as was noted in this article entitled, An Association of Serotonin with Pain Disorders and its modulation by estrogens. And this article also noted that high levels of estrogens exacerbates pain sensation, which may also explain partially why fibromyalgia is more often found in females than in males. As we can see, there's about a three to four to one ratio with regards to prevalence of fibromyalgia. And it's also known that fibromyalgia is highly associated with depression and anxiety disorders. And as we mentioned before, depression and anxiety are related to issues with serotonergic functioning. And depression and anxiety disorders are also conditions known to have dysregulated stress responses and stress, whether that be physical and or mental stress, is known to modulate symptoms of fibromyalgia. And we're going to talk about how stress may do this in the next upcoming slides. So with regards to stress, stress can be modulated, whether that is physical or mental stress, it can be modulated by activity levels, relaxation methods, coping methods, those types of factors. So as we mentioned before, stress can modulate fibromyalgia symptoms. Increased stress seems to lead to increased fibromyalgia symptoms. But what's also important here is that stress also is associated with alterations in serotonergic and immune functioning. And I bring up immune functioning here, as we'll see, is important in some of this underlying pathology as well.
And then we can also see that there may be some interaction between alterations in serotonergic and immune functioning and fibromyalgia symptoms. So they're all tied together. So how this all happens is that when there's increased stress, there's a release of corticotropin releasing factor or CRF from the hypothalamus. And this leads to activation of the HPA axis. It activates or induces the release of ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone from the anterior pituitary, leading to activation of the HPA axis or hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And this leads to ACTH going to the adrenal glands, which are glands that sit atop your kidneys, and it leads to the release of cortisol. And this leads to hypercortisolemia, a high level of cortisol in the blood. And ultimately, this cortisol, acutely and chronically, mostly it is a chronic issue. When there's high levels of cortisol for long periods of time, this can lead to decreased T cell functioning and natural killer cell activity. CRF can also lead to microglial activation in the brain, and it can activate the sympathetic nervous system. Very important. CRF can lead to activation of the sympathetic nervous system, but the sympathetic nervous system can also be activated by other types of activities, including exercise, especially certain types of exercise. And then the sympathetic nervous system can also lead to activation of microglial cells as well. Importantly here, sympathetic nervous system activation leads to release of norepinephrine and epinephrine. And microglia activation leads to macrophage activation. And we'll see here as well, norepinephrine leads to macrophage activation as well. The activation of macrophages, these white blood cells, leads to increased levels of TNF or tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1 or IL-1, IL-2, and IL-6. And you may be wondering why I'm talking about the immune system so much here. A lot of these outcomes, these immunological changes, can impact the serotonergic system. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. So again, stress seems to be related to fibromyalgia symptoms and can lead to alterations in immune system functioning and the serotonergic system. And it does it by activating the sympathetic nervous system and the HPA axis along with microglial activation. And with regards to the HPA axis, this leads to hypercortisolemia, leading to decreased T cell functioning and natural killer cell activity, especially when it's chronic, when it's chronic hypercortisolemia. Sympathetic nervous system activation through stress, whether that be physical or mental stress, and this can occur with certain types of exercise, especially vigorous exercise, can lead to high levels of norepinephrine or other catecholamines like epinephrine. And ultimately, these can lead to macrophage activation. And macrophage activation can lead to high levels of tumor necrosis factor, IL-1, IL-2, and IL-6, these chemokines. So now that we know all that, let's talk about tryptophan and the synthesis of serotonin. And we're going to see why I talked about all of those immune system outcomes from the last slide. So tryptophan normally is acted on by the enzyme tryptophan hydroxylase. And there's two isoforms of this enzyme, tryptophan hydroxylase 1 and 2. Both of these enzymes can add a hydroxyl group to tryptophan, and we can see it added here, to form 5-hydroxytryptophan, or 5-HTP. And the important point with regards to this enzyme is that it is the limiting step, which means that it is the bottleneck. This determines the speed at which we can get 5-hydroxytryptophan, and as we'll see later, serotonin. Once we have 5-hydroxytryptophan, or 5-HTP, it gets acted on by the enzyme L-aromatic amino acid decarboxylase to form 5-hydroxytryptamine, 5-HT, otherwise known as serotonin. So it decarboxylates 5-HTP, it removes a CO2 molecule to form serotonin, 5-hydroxytryptamine. And there's some other steps in between, but 5-hydroxytryptamine can ultimately be processed into melatonin, which is what we refer to as the sleep hormone. It helps regulate sleep cycles. So as you can see, serotonin, we talked about this before, it's important in mood regulation, cognition, and we can see here melatonin, which is also derived from serotonin, is important in regulating sleep-wake cycles. So as you can see here, these are very important. But the problem that can arise is that before tryptophan can get processed into 5-hydroxytryptamine or melatonin, is that it may be degraded by enzymes like 
idolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, or IDO, or tryptophan dioxygenase, or TDO, into the breakdown product kinurinine. And kinurinine can also be processed further into kinurinine metabolites. Now, the reason why I talked about those cytokines in the previous slide is that those cytokines like IL-1, IL-6, and tumor necrosis factor can activate idolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, or IDO. So it can activate this enzyme, essentially increasing the degradation of tryptophan into kinurinine and kinurinine metabolites. And then the other problem is that cortisol, as we talked about before in the last slide, cortisol can activate tryptophan dioxygenase, or TDO. So this too can increase activity of this enzyme and increase the degradation of tryptophan into kinurinine and kinurinine metabolites. So having high levels of IL-1, IL-6, TNF, and cortisol may essentially reroute tryptophan into the kinurinine pathway, into the degradation of tryptophan, which would lead to decreased levels of tryptophan, decreased levels of serotonin, and decreased levels of melatonin, which, as we can see, may play a role in a lot of the symptoms we talked about before. So that begs the question, is fibromyalgia a tryptophan kinurinine pathway pathology? It has been found that the kinurinine tryptophan ratio is abnormal in fibromyalgia, and it does appear that fibromyalgia is associated with issues in the tryptophan kinurinine pathway, as was noted in this article entitled Plasma Tryptophan and Kinurinine in Females with Temporomandibular Disorders and Fibromyalgia, an Exploratory Pilot Study. And in this article entitled Kinurinine Pathway Pathologies, do nicotinamide and other pathway cofactors have a therapeutic role in reduction of symptom severity, including chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia? As we mentioned before, symptoms of fibromyalgia may be modulated by stress levels. And we know from the last slide that stress hormones are known to induce degradation of tryptophan. So there does seem to be some connection here. And ultimately, as we saw in the last slide, there's that limiting step, that limiting enzyme in the processing of tryptophan to serotonin and ultimately to melatonin. And that is the tryptophan hydroxylase enzyme. And that tryptophan hydroxylase enzyme converts tryptophan to 5-hydroxytryptophan or 5-HTP. And it has been shown that consumption of 5-HTP is associated with improvements in symptoms of fibromyalgia. And 5-HTP can be found in supplement form and in certain foods like certain plants. Now, one of the first studies to look at 5-HTP and its influence on fibromyalgia is this article entitled Double Blind Study of 5-Hydroxytryptophan versus Placebo in the Treatment of Primary Fibromyalgia Syndrome. So this is one of the first clinical trials to look at 5-HTP and its effects in primary fibromyalgia syndrome. And then there was this related study a couple of years later entitled Primary Fibromyalgia Syndrome and 5-Hydroxy-L-Tryptophan, a 90-day open study. Since then, since 1992, there really hasn't been much performed by way of looking at 5-HTP and fibromyalgia. So a lot is still quoted from this research. So in that 1992 study, patients received 100 milligrams of 5-HTP three times per day for 90 days. And that study found significant improvements in all measured indices, including pain intensity, quality of sleep, morning stiffness, anxiety, and fatigue. So it looks like 5-hydroxytryptophan or 5-HTP can inhibit or reduce pain, anxiety, and fatigue. What was important to note from the study was that there wasn't much more further improvement after 60 days of 5-HTP use. And in fact, when you look at the study, it looks like effects become plateaued at around 30 days of use. So when a patient starts taking 5-HTP, by day 30 to 60, they have seen the best improvements. And after that, effects don't seem to improve much more. So they do have continued improvement with continued use, but there's no further increased or further improvements after that 60-day period. So even in other sources, the recommended dose for fibromyalgia is 100 milligrams PO, which means by mouth, TID, which means three times per day for one month. And this is what is quoted in other medical sources. But there was one caveat here with regards to 5-HTP use in that it was associated with eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. And another point to note was that it should not be used with SSRIs 
or SNRIs or other pro-serotonergic substances like St. John's Ward. So with regards to the eosinophilia myalgia syndrome association, this seems to be related to some contaminant in the 5-HTP supplement. So this may not be the big issue here, but again, this is something to note because there was some association between this syndrome and 5-HTP use. Now, having said all of that, how might serotonin modulate all of those fibromyalgia symptoms we talked about before? So the serotonergic system is highly, highly complex. This is a very, very small overview of the serotonergic system. There are 15 serotonin receptors, and they all have slightly different roles in slightly different parts of the central nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. So I'm going to talk about some of those receptors here in the slide. One of them is the 5-HT1A receptor. Another one is 5-HT2B receptor. And then other receptors include 5-HT4 and 5-HT6 receptors. In the brain, these seem to have effects on regulation of mood. So when these receptors are activated, this has an antidepressant effect. It improves mood. So you can see here if there's low serotonin, which may occur in fibromyalgia, these receptors are not going to be activated like they should be. So we're going to have issues with low mood. And as we've mentioned before, depression is highly associated with fibromyalgia. And these receptors also play a role in regulating fatigue and sleep. So when these are activated, there's improvement in fatigue and sleep. So again, if there's not enough serotonin to activate these receptors, we're going to have fatigue and sleep disturbances. Now, there are serotonin receptors in the spinal cord as well. This is found more in animal models, and it's likely that serotonin also plays a role in regulating parts of the spinal cord in humans as well. But in an animal model, it's been found that 5-HT2C and 5-HT3 receptors in the spinal cord have antinociceptive or pain modulation. Antinociceptive means that they have abilities to reduce pain. So serotonin activating these receptors in the spinal cord reduces pain. So if there is low serotonin levels, as again, we might see in fibromyalgia, this can lead to decreased activation of these receptors, decreased activation of serotonin receptors in the spinal cord, which may lead to increased pain. So this, again, may be a possible mechanism as to why serotonin plays a role in some of these symptoms of fibromyalgia. Again, this system is very, very complex, and this doesn't necessarily explain why this happens in fibromyalgia specifically. So why might there be issues with activation of some of these antinociceptive receptors, as opposed to some other conditions that are known to have serotonergic dysfunctioning as well, we're not sure. And again, the serotonin system is very, very complex. Some serotonin receptors have opposite effects to some of these, including mood and sleep regulation. So again, it's a very, very complex system. We're going to get into more specific detail with regards to the underlying pathophysiology of fibromyalgia in future lessons. But I hope you found this lesson helpful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. And as always, thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.